and this is Aileen Finger from the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh and she's a conservation geneticist and working on the conservation of threatened and important plant species in Scotland. She's trying to bridge the gap between scientific research and applied conservation work on the ground to maximise success rates of conservation efforts. So uh, this is all very good news to my ears as a conservation manager in the uplands of Scotland. So very much looking forward to her talk on uh, conserving Oblon Woodsia. Great, thank you very much. Let's see whether this works. Um, so if I don't hear complaints, I'm assuming that everything is working. So yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And oopa, there we go, too fast. And um, yeah, so I, I'm a conservation geneticist uh, at RBGE, as mentioned. And so I'm not a fern expert, but I happen to help with um, some conservation work that we're doing on the Oblong Woodsia. And today I would like to present um, the, some of the conservation work that we have done on, on the Oblong Woodsia, uh, why we work on the species, um, what, what kind of work has been done, and also uh, look a bit at what kind of work we're planning to do uh, in the next few years. And just to mention that part of this presentation will be um, using data from our PhD student, Nadia Russell. Um, and so there are a few slides that are marked with a please don't tweet signs. So just because we're working or because I'm presenting very preliminary data, so it'd be, it would be good if we don't tweet it um, just at this stage. And yeah, so the, the pictures on the slide show um, the, the fern. Um, would say it's a, fa a fairly small fern. So the front length is between three and 10 centimeters. Um, and it's, um, it occurs, so it's, it's got a circumboreal um, distribution. And um, yeah, it, it occurs at high elevations. Um, and uh, since the last glacial maximum, I think there is some evidence that the fern has moved from Europe to, to Great Britain, where it probably used to occur a bit more frequently, but then with, with increase in temperatures and climate, um, it's retreated to higher elevations and has become a bit more scarce. So, um, yeah, so just looking at my notes, just making sure I don't forget anything. Um, so yeah, generally it's not a strong competitor. So, which is why in the pictures you see, I mean, it grows in very unstable rocky areas where it's got less competition. And this uh, makes monitoring efforts quite, um, <laughs> quite challenging to say the least, but we'll get to that later. So because of, um, because of just um, the, the climatic requirements of the species, it's always been fairly rare in the UK and probably because it's rare, but also generally um, um, there was an interest in the fern during the Victorian fern craze, where lots of ferns have been collected. And this period is also called the pteridomania, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, and there is some, some, uh, some sad evidence um, of that and the effects that had on species. So for example, there's a site near Moffat in Scotland where there are reports in 1848, um, the fern has been, so the oblong woodsia has been described to be in considerable abundance in 57, in some quantity in 59, they found 14 plants in less than an hour and probably collected them, which is a bit of a shame. And then what's that, 23 years later, there was evidence of uh, sparseness. And yeah, it's, and generally like herbarium, Herbaria are really important for our conservation work and for, you know, for to understand more about um, our plants. But it's actually quite sad when you go through the herbarium, you see these sheets with, um, with Woodsia ilvensis plants that have just been ripped out, including the roots and knowing how rare they are nowadays. 
So as a consequence, um, it has become a priority species for conservation. Um, it's protected under several different legis legislations and many people are really enthusiastic about the conservation of this fern. Um, so, for example, the Woodsy Alvensis Steering Committee consists of, of members of um, all, you know, across the UK, uh, representatives of all different, of, of a lot of different conservation organizations. Um, and the, the aim is to have a more unified approach um, to conservation so that we all have a strategic approach um, to, to protect the fern, which, which makes it much more efficient. So, as I said, there are only five locations left in Scotland, and these are the locations. We have three locations in um, sorry, in the UK, we have three locations in, in Scotland. Um, the top one is Glenfeshie in the Cairngorms. Then the second one is um, Corrie Fee yeah, in Angus. Then um, a, a population near to Moffat in the borders. And then there's one population in England, uh, Wasdale, and um, there are a couple of sites in, in Wales. But in total, these, you know, the numbers are extremely small. Um, so this uh, here, well, we've got the, the sites here, we've got the locations. The elevation is between 400 meters and 650 meters, roughly. And so these figures here were um, from monitoring done by Nadia in, in 2016, I think, and she found like, or, you know, there, there are three plants in Glenfeshie, eight in, in Corifee, five near Moffat, and then the Wasdale population, 140 plants, the largest populations, population we have compared to previous figures. Um, this is also the only population that has increased in numbers. Um, and actually, apologies, I think this, this figure is actually wrong, or not yet only went to certain places, maybe, but the, the Wales populations, I think, are between 20 or 25 plants, um, and they have not decreased as far as I know. But um, nevertheless, overall, we have less than 250 plants left in the UK, which are, is a really, really low number. So various, various conversation eff conservation efforts have been done um, over the past 25 years. Uh, and that includes monitoring and sorry, and that work has been not just done by RBGE, but also many partners, many other organizations, lots of individuals. Um, and part of the work is to monitor these wild populations. And as I said, I mean, there's, a, there's an example here uh, on the left picture uh, of what a typical Woodsy Elvensis site looks like. Uh, sorry, and Woodsy Elvensis is obviously the Latin name for the oblong Woodsia. Um, so very loose scree habitat, um, and that moves as, as soon as you step on it. So um, monitoring is very challenging. Um, and I have to say, I've never been to these sites in person, actually, but just knowing from, um, from reports and from just looking at the pictures, I can imagine how difficult it, it must be. And then um, monitoring is actually quite intense, uh, like every single plant, uh, usually pictures are taken, the, the size of the ferns are being um, um, recorded, the, the front lengths, how many fronts they have and so on. So quite a lot of work is going into that. Um, and what we've also done is, uh, in the past, we've, we've collected spores and uh, DNA samples from all populations. And the spores have then been used to uh, grow plants. And so these plants are now available in the ex situ conservation collection at RBGE, where we've got all the UK genotypes present. Um, yeah, so, so these UK genotypes are now safeguarded for the future. But um, because it's a conservation collection, it's only going to be, um, you know, it's only going to do any good if we actually use it for conservation. Um, and this is in line with the wider Target 8 um, project that we are having at RBGE. So I just wanted to mention that it's not just about Woodsia, um, but we're trying to um, have 
a large proportion of, of rare plants in these collections um, at large numbers so that we can use them for translocations. And target eight um, is, is one of 16 targets of the global strategy for plant conservation, which aims to ensure that 75% of threatened plants are protected in culti cultivation, but not just protected, but that at least 20% are also available for recovery and restoration by 2020. So it's a bit out of date, but we continue at RBGE, we continue this target eight project. And uh, the picture you see here is our dedicated tunnel, which just exists for, um, for, this, uh, for this target eight project. And so particularly, uh, or specifically for the Oblong Woodsia, um, this, this ex situ collection has then been used over the past 25 or so years to actually do uh, translocations. And these collections do not only provide us with plants that we can use for translocations, but they are also really important um, to study the plants, to understand the biology and the reproductive you know, cycle of plants to, um, yeah, and all, and all this helps us to better understand and conserve the plants. So for example, we've developed growing conditions, particularly growing protocols for the oblong woods here. Uh, and we've got a really good understanding now how to produce like um, healthy plants. Um, and the other thing is we've, in the past, we've done some gametophyte experiments and all this, you know, all this extra information helps us to in, in our conservation efforts. But at the same time, we don't have to go to really wild vulnerable populations to, to understand more about the ferns and then you know, introduce even more uh, threats to these populations. Right, but as mentioned, crucially, <laughs> what we can do with these collections is do restoration work. And that's uh, what's been done at RVG or again with, with partners. Um, so, um, in the past, we've had um, eight conservation translocations. So I use that term. So, so conservation translocations are um, pretty much uh, any kind of plant movement that has a conservation, um, um, what's the word, with, with a co intention for conservation. So that includes reintroductions, augmentations, and so on. Um, so. So we have done eight of these conservation translocations, but unfortunately with fairly limited success rates. <laughs> so if we look at um, the survival rates, um, rates, or let, let me talk you through the table first. So we've got the different sites here with several sites in, in Scotland, the first four in Scotland, then we have two in Teesdale, two in the Lake District. And the first translocations have been done in 1999 for example, the latest one in 2011. Um, and so we've had quite a long time since planting to actually evaluate the success or failure of these, of these translocations. Um, so between 11 and 23 years since, since we've planted. And so, but looking at the survival rate, if, if we take this as our success uh, measure, um, survival rate is fairly average, I would say. So some populations have clearly not been successful, like the one near Moffat with only 2% survival rate. So it's unlikely these plants, <laughs> I mean, they're going to come back in any way. So it's most, most likely this has failed. But then we have other um, uh, reintroductions like at Glen Feshi, where at the mo well, <laughs> um, we have 95% survival rate, but this we need to I need to mention that the last time we monitored this population was in 2010. So actually it may have changed uh, quite a bit. But so my conclusion from this is that um, these translocations have only had limited survival rates and also more crucially, there's no reproduction. So after 23 years of planting, yes, some plants survive, but actually we have no new plants emerging. So is that really a success even if some plants survive? And then the second uh, conclusion is for me, and as you all uh, know, like this long-term monitoring data is so important to understand success rates in conservation translocations, but also generally in conservation. And um, especially considering the short funding periods we often have for, um, for projects. So 
Yeah, long-term data is really important. Right, so um, there are still a lot of open questions and we really want to understand why there's no reproduction in the wild, um, how we can um, be more successful with the way we do our conservation work. And um, Nadia Russell is actually doing her PhD on this and tries to find some answers to these questions. And so um, what I'm presenting from, from here is pretty much her PhD research. Um, yeah, so there are several possible reasons why, why you know, none of our work is, why the wild populations uh, are not doing well and uh, our reintroductions, and that could be down to things like grazing, trampling, disturbance, or the climate is just really unsuitable for that species um, nowadays. Or um, there could be genetic problems or just any other biological reasons. So a lot of questions. Um, one of the things we can fairly easily test um, is um, the, the genetic problems. So we can see whether, um, for example, there's low diversity, genetic diversity or high inbreeding rates. So that is a fairly simple thing to do. The other things, you know, we, we can compare um, the UK to other countries and things like that as well. But um, if we want like just good data, we can, we can look at the genetics first. So, and let me briefly give, um, uh, um, just talk about the conservation genetics theory behind that. So why would we look at genetics? And the thing is that, so fragmentation, or in this case, over collection through uh, Victorians, <laughs> uh, leads to population, just a reduction in numbers uh, and in population, but also numbers within population. And very often then um, even these populations are quite separate and isolated in isolated patches. And what that uh, leads to is elevated amounts of inbreeding. So the breeding between close relatives, uh, it's a problem for humans, it's a problem for animals, and it's the same problem for plants. Because um, inbreeding usually causes the expression of deleterious or harmful alleles. And that do, um, leads to a lower fitness, lower vigor, lower, you know, reduced um, germination rates for plants, for flowering plants at least, um, and so on. Um, the iso and reduction in population size and isolation also leads to a loss of genetic diversity. And all that taken together leads to an elevated risk of extinction. Um, and that is all negative, but there's something positive that we can do about this. So, and that is called genetic rescue. And this is what we're trying to, to see whether it's possible for, for this species. And genetic rescue is an increase in fitness of small populations resulting from the alleviation of inbreeding depression by immigrants. So in other words, if we have small and inbred populations and we bring new uh, genes or new individuals into these populations, that should, in theory, increase fitness. And there's a lot of evidence that speaks for that, for flowering plants. Now, I've not seen any uh, work done on ferns uh, on genetic rescue. But generally speaking, so there are two key elements in conservation genetics, and that's the most important thing from this slide. We want to have, we want to keep the genetic diversity as high as we can, because that allows populations to adapt to, you know, climate change, pests and diseases, whatever. And the other thing is we want to keep inbreeding low, because inbreeding lowers the fitness on plant vigor. So the first thing that Nadia did was tra to travel to Norway and Canada, because these are places where the, where the oblong woods here occurs more frequently. And so the idea is that they are probably genetically more healthy there. You know, they, they don't have any, any um, issues that we're aware of in these countries. So she collected spores from different sites in these two countries, brought them back for, to RBGE, grew them up you know, um, in the nursery. So we, we have plants from Canada and Norway in the nursery as well now. So, and this is a slide, I'm, I'm gonna take a bit longer here um, because these are the, the preliminary results that we have. Um, and I'm gonna take a bit longer here just to talk you through the slides. Um, so pretty much what Nadia has done, she collected, uh, so we, we've got all the, 
um, or we, co um, we collected samples from all UK populations. Uh, where's my cursor? There we go. Uh, so we've got the five populations in the UK. We've got uh, samples from plants in Norway. We've got Canadian plants. And then we had the, the, just one plant in Iceland and one plant in Russia, which we were growing in the nursery anyway. And what she's done is um, she looked at the genetic diversity and then inbreeding rates for these um, populations and individuals by using 10 microsatellite loci. And these are pretty much just genetic markers. They, they, they are small bits of DNA at specific locations in the DNA. And then we compare these specific locations at all these individuals. Um, so we sampled, she sampled a certain number of plants, but then, for example, in Corifee, a lot of the, the sampled plants are very close to each other. So we weren't actually sure whether this is one plant, two plants, three plants. So um, with the genetic data, we could identify individuals. So she collected from seven what we thought were different plants, but actually genetically, we can only identify two individuals, right? So all the, all the, all the analysis are based on these two individuals. And to make the <laughs> these figures a bit shorter, pretty much uh, what we find is that we have a really, really low genetic diversity in the UK. So genetic diversity here is expected heterozygosity. The lower the number, the lower the diversity. And we've got some populations like Corifi or Wasdale that have extremely low, have an extremely low genetic diversity compared to, for example, Canadian populations that have, uh, this, this is con probably considered uh, medium to just about, yeah, just about intermediate genetic diversity. Um, interestingly, Norway has a fairly low genetic diversity as well. And if we look at inbreeding, and inbreeding, if we remember, uh, we want inbreeding to be low. So the, um, we, um, so if we have a zero, that's good. And if we have a one, that is really not good. <laughs> and so quite a lot of the populations have a high, high, really high inbreeding values. So the values go from zero to one. Um, so again, so we have low genetic diversity and we have high inbreeding, exactly what we don't want to have to have um, healthy populations. And um, the last complicated slide, I promise. <laughs> so if we then do a principal component analysis, which is based on genetic distance. Um, so this just shows us how similar or dissimilar individuals are. Um, and pretty much if the do each dot is an individual and if the dots are far apart, they are very dissimilar. If they are very close together, they are similar. So, and what this shows us is that we pretty much have two major groups here. You've, you've got also got the color coding on the right. Um, so we have a left group here, which consists, which clusters all the Canadian um, populations. Uh, and then the, and the two odd individuals from Russia and Iceland that we just, um, analyzed as well. And then on the right here, we have one cluster that consists of UK and Norwegian plants, which is a bit odd because they are two, they are two different countries and the individuals that we um, analyze from these two countries are so similar that actually we can't tell them apart, which is very surprising um, because actually with the markers we used, we should be able to see a clear difference between the different countries. So, um, um, there is evidence that um, that, the, that the oblong woodsia um, came to the UK through Scandinavia, so that makes sense that they are similar. But again, we should be able to differentiate between these countries. So, yeah, either there has been absolutely no evolutionary step since they came to the UK like 10,000 years ago or something, or maybe we had some keen botanists from Norway bringing some plants in, which again I think is fairly unlikely. But yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. So if anyone has got a good um, <laughs> good idea of how to interpret that, I'd welcome that. Uh, and then finally, just one slide to, to, to show what uh, Nadia is intending to do in the next few years. So again, going back to the genetic rescue theory. Um, so if the idea is if, if we mix from different populations and different countries and you know different genotypes, we should have a higher fitness. So what she's hoping to do is 
do some uh, crosses with spores. And we've got all the plants in the nursery. We've got them from Scotland, England, Wales, Canada, and Norway. So we're going to do some selfing. So where we use spores from the same populations and some crossings and all sorts of different combinations, which is going to be a lot of combinations and crossings. Uh, and then do some, and then once we've crossed and selfed, we will have a look at whether crossing actually does increase fitness um, as, as the theory predicts, but we're not sure. And we still have to figure out how to do that exactly because spores are very small and it's going to be a bit tricky to do that properly. And yeah, and then obviously we're going to use plants that come out of that for, for future um, translocation. So just as a quick summary, um, um, so the genetics have shown us the UK populations have a very low genetic diversity and high inbreeding. Um, the UK and Norway populations are very, very similar genetically, which is surprising in a way. Um, and then we will try to do spore crossings to test whether plant vigor and survival can be increased, which will help our conservation. And previous conservation translocations have shown that um, we have very limited success rates. Uh, we do have survival, but no reproduction. And obviously correct microsighting will be very important. And maybe that was something that went wrong as well. But it just also shows the importance of long-term monitoring data. And yeah, new tra translocations should not just repeat what we've done in the past because it's obviously not been particularly successful. So ideally, we'll, we'll use like genetically improved or crossed plants to, um, to do this in the future. Um, and then, yeah, so following long-term isolation, it's obvious that the oblong has, le has been left genetically depauperate. Um, and it's really important to increase the diversity to give it a chance to adapt to future um, issues. And um, a good way of doing that is through conservation translocations. And sadly, the, the case of the oblong woodsia is, um, just represents a wider conservation issue that so many other plants uh, are, are facing, not just plants, actually species are facing in, in the UK. So sadly, this is just one of many, many other cases. Um, Right, and with that, thank you very much. Um, there have been some some organizations funding Nadia's work, so thanks for that. And uh, yeah, many, many different individuals and steering group for, for helping. So um, yeah, and thank you for listening <laughs> on a sunny day like this. Thank you so much for such an interesting talk, Aileen. Um, yeah, absolutely fan fascinating and huge interest to me as someone working in plant conservation in the uplands and particularly someone who loves long-term plant monitoring data. I've not had the chance to see oblong woodsia myself yet, although I'm familiar with the slightly more common alpine woodsia from Ben Laws, so hopefully maybe one day I'll get the chance to visit it. And I think there's a really great talk for highlighting the importance of exit to conservation work involving scientific research as well, mm -hmm. and uh, important data on genetic diversity and fascinatingly how closely related the Norwegian and British plants are. Um, so yeah, much still to be discovered and really looking forward to seeing what uh, your work and Nadia's work and um, the further work that comes out of her PhD. Um, so yeah, we've got some questions here. Um, I will take the first one here from Paul Smith. Um, do planted out specimens which don't survive succumb to common factors or are the causes of death varied? Well, uh, yeah, the one million dollar question. <laughs> so if we knew why they didn't survive, that, that would make life much, much easier. It's really hard to tell. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not a fern expert. So, um, but the way I understood reports and um, people who have planted um, the, the ferns out. So th there might be a few things. So water might be an issue, watering, then, um, the, the other thing is just in the in the locations where they grow, which is like very rocky habitats, and they've been transplanted into these rocky habitats. Um, there's not much soil left, so when we transplant the plants, they come with a little bit of you know compost and soil. So after a few years, once the nutrients or whatever are, are used up from from this, then they start to really decrease in size and struggle a bit. 
So that again raises the questions whether question whether we're always planting it in the right spot, which is really really difficult. Uh, you know what looks good to us may not be good to a good site spot for the plant. Um, and then, yeah, so so many different different reasons. It it might just be that they weren't. Well, I, I, no, I think that so it's from memory. Sorry, because I've not done the the reintroductions myself. But from memory, I think they've always used similar sized plants as well. So it shouldn't be like the initial size difference. Um, and then the last thing I can think of, apparently, but then I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to say, say that, <laughs> whether I'm going to offend anyone, but I think there might also be a planter issue. So when people who are very used to planting, you know, or really keen gardeners or horticulturists plant, I think there may have been some effect of that as well. So, and it's a bit more uh, successful compared to if you have a bunch of volunteers and they don't, you know, they've never worked with this species. Um, maybe success rates are slightly higher if you actually um, have a, someone who's who's done a lot of planting in the past. But I don't have evidence for that. That it was just some <laughs> something I heard um, uh, in the past. So yeah, could be so many different issues. Thank you. Uh, should I ask the next question? Um, well, uh, thank you, Aileen. That was a fantastic talk, really interesting. Uh, Falgani Sarkar asks, uh, was there oblong woodsia present in the past at all these sites? Um, and suggests, would it be suitable uh, for local, bon mon sorry, local botanical groups to help monitor them? Uh, yeah, um, so as far as I know, all the sites where they've been uh, reintroduced, so that used to be sites where they used to occur at some point in the past. Now, the question is whether that means they are currently a good site, because, you know, the climate has changed. So maybe, maybe we should be a bit more adventurous in the sites we pick for translocations instead of going back to places where they've already uh, gone extinct. Um, yeah, maybe find new spots that might be a bit more suitable to current climate, um, clim climatic conditions, and maybe try completely different sites um, as well. But then you need a lot of plants, <laughs> and it's time. It takes a lot of time to grow these plants, so we can't be too adventurous. But yeah, maybe worth thinking about different different sites as well. Um, in terms of monitoring, and um, generally. Possibly, um, the only um, issue is there is a bit of a secrecy around where exactly these sites are, just because of the, you know, it's it's very sensitive. Um, first of all, because the the habitats are very um, unstable, so it's very easy to cause a lot of damage, um, and also because it's rare. Um, the the more we talk about where they actually grow, the higher the likelihood that some people, you know. Not even maybe meaning badly, but then there is a chance of causing more harm than than positive effects. But um, it would it might definitely yeah be be useful to have some extra help. So if anyone is interested, they they can get in touch with me absolutely. And thanks for the offer. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I think that's a really important point you made just there about like with conservation management decisions not being necessarily completely led with where the threatened plants are growing at that time or where they've recently been extinct from because it might not be their best site for them to actually grow now in current conditions. So it's always a complex uh, issue than making choices where, where to sort of focus your efforts on. Um, I've got a question myself, um, just thinking about propagating arctic alpine plants, upland plants more in general. Um, and when you've got ex situ collections, obviously they're in lower altitude locations down, down in, the, in, in the city. And I just wondered if there's a difference for growing the plants down in low, low altitudes than the sort of where in the kind of colder <laughs> conditions up the hill that they would be used to. Does that, does that change things, how, how they grow? Do they grow better or worse um, in the ex situ collection? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point. Um, so 
well, different things I'm thinking. <laughs> so one is, there, there is a reason why we don't want to keep plants forever in the nursery. And that is pretty much what you're saying, because it's not so much the growing them in the first place, because they're, you know, they probably, we can easily grow them. Um, that's not an issue. But over time, they, they almost become adapted to the conditions. <laughs> and then it's not that we are producing weaklings, but, you know, they, they have the perfect conditions. They have the perfect compost, perf perfect watering. They have different climatic conditions. And then you put them up onto the mountaintops. So that is a bit of an issue. But I think as long as you don't keep them forever in the nursery and plant them out fairly quickly, that we might be able to just slowly adapt them to these areas. Um, so, but the having said that, um, we were trying to grow uh, to um, germinate plants from uh, high high altitude mountain plants, Sabulina nivalis, and actually they never germinated. So either, and now the question is, did they not germinate because uh, the you know the seeds weren't viable? Or did we have a warm winter? Because we did have a warm winter, and actually germination success are lower in a you know low altitude nursery. So that is a very good point. So actually, we're actually trying to think about how we could adjust that in the future, and maybe put them in the fridge freezer. You know, there are different methods to to probably uh, adjust to that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a clear answer. <laughs> Can I sneak in a, a quick question on a related uh, subject? Valerie Hempel asks, could the reduction in snow cover uh, in Britain affect survival? Yeah, no idea. <laughs> to make it quick. <laughs> yes, absolutely, it could. And um, if it's, a, you know, it is a cold, um, well, Borea montane species, so they, it is possible. But it's probably not so much snow cover, but also the when the snow melts, I mean, the protection, but also when the snow melts, they have more water, I suspect, especially if they're in the scree area. So there, there might be some link there between water, snow, and, and all sorts. But yeah, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, area for further research. Um, in Scotland, the impact of snow covered the climb. We've definitely got lots of theories about that being really important, but it's very difficult to actually study in the field just the nature of the mountain environment in winter making these observations. So, um, well, thanks very much anyway for answering all those questions.